Hello BookTube and all Repairman Jack fans, my name is Nathan, thank you so much for watching and welcome to my channel. Uh, if you did not already know, one of the things that I'm doing on my channel is I am doing a, a reading series. Uh, so I'm going through every single Repairman Jack book in publication order for the most part and I am posting two review videos a week. So I'm reading one book a week and then I post a short spoiler free review video of the book on Friday and then the following Thursday I post a longer discussion video getting into the actual content of the book. So believe it or not we are already on to week number four and so that is All the Rage. All the Rage was published, uh, it was first published in 2000 I believe in the fall, October of 2000. This is following Conspiracies which was also published in the year 2000 uh, but much earlier in the year I believe February somewhere around there. Um, so Conspiracies, uh, if you have not read this before and you have been reading Repairman Jack or um, if you have um, not read Conspiracies in a while it is really fun to go back to. I think just talking to a few people already then Conspiracies is definitely up there as a, a favorite amongst many readers of Repairman Jack and that's certainly true for me. All the Rage is great as well. Um, I'm not um, trying to compare the two and, and say that All the Rage isn't as good as Conspiracies. It's just that the fun thing with Conspiracies is that you get introduced to the much larger world, the secret history of the world, um, the ally and the adversary. You get to see Rosalom or Sal Roma and so you get introduced to all of that stuff and so that's obviously really exciting when you get into that. So then you have All the Rage which does have connections to this and as best I remember you're going to see this from basically every book going forward. Book number five, which I'm going to post my uh, short spoiler free review video, that is Hosts. So that one will get posted tomorrow. So that's going to be um, the discussion video for that will be next week. So All the Rage, let me give you a, a quick, a very quick rundown of the plot as a reminder. So basically what you have in this is you have um, Jack and Gia and Vicky, they are off. I think they're going to the Museum of Natural History or they're at least in that neighborhood and they're out on the weekend. And then there is uh, a, a small group of preppy middle-aged guys who just start going crazy and they start becoming incredibly violent, attacking people right on the streets of New York City. So then Jack, he ends up having to save Vicky and he gets them out of there. And then you find out as the book starts to progress that these guys, they were um, at a school reunion. They were very um, affluent guys who all went to this prep school. And so um, not the, the type of people you would expect to become randomly violent and attacking bystanders, uh, bystanders on the street. So you find out that they have basically have taken this new designer drug. Um, it goes by various street names, but either Loki or Berserk um, are the two that get most commonly used in All the Rage. Now, I, I'm like I say, this is a spoiler. Um, there, there are plenty of spoilers in this video. So what you end up finding out is that Sal Roma has been orchestrating this entire thing. So he's just constantly there in the background trying to do anything that he can to upset humanity, to help the otherness, and to antagonize the ally. Uh, just any kind of things that he can do that will upset humanity. So if you think back, and I should have grabbed this off the shelf already. If you think back to the first Repairman Jack book, The Tomb, then you know that one of the Rakoshi monsters seemingly survives at the end it's it's a little unclear jack just thinks that the thing is dead and i'm reading this going like it's not dead um even the first time i read it i'm like there's no indication that that rakoshi monster is dead because basically what happens at the end of this is you have the entire ship of rakoshi monsters they all uh, the ship explodes they're all down in the hull of the ship and um he he set all these different uh, charges across it and of course fire takes them out so then the, the ship explodes, the Rakoshi monster has been attacking Jack on the shore where you've got um, Gia is there and um, you've got Abe who's there and the Rakoshi monster sees the ship that explodes in this big fireball and then he swims after it. So then that's kind of the last you see of it and then Jack's just like, oh, well, therefore it's dead. Uh, but that doesn't 
actually indicate that he's dead. And so that's where you get into all the rage. And it's dun dun dun, dun. Yeah, the Rakoshi monster's not dead. So Sal Roma, he contacts the owner of a, a traveling um, sideshow, essentially, a, a traveling uh, carnival where it's featuring sideshow performers or, you know, a, a freak show um, would be the, the more vulgar description for it. And so basically putting on display people who have got various disabilities, physical disabilities, and then you put them on display. And, um, you know, this has got a long history, um, you know, not just in the United States, but um, all over, right? Then you've got different traveling sideshows like this. And so he's got one. So it's called the Ozymandias Pr uh, Prather or Prather, Ozymandias Prather Oddity Emporium. And um, the interesting thing, now I was not really familiar with this. I don't know if I skipped over the author's note the first time that I read it or I just forgot, but there is an author's note at the beginning of this from F. Paul Wilson, where he says the Ozymandias Prather Oddity Emporium may seem familiar to some readers. Freak Show, the anthology I edited for the Horror Writers of America, chronicled its final tour. Thanks to Stephen Spruill, Spruill? and Thomas Monteleone for allowing their characters from the anthology to appear here. So this is basically what ends up happening to me anytime I'm reading something. I'm like, oh, well, now I got to go and read that. So I, I will add that to my list of ancillary books that I have to read in short stories because it's starting to add up. So I will probably get to a few different things. Um, like, for example, The Weapon Shop is a short story that I want to read because um, Abe with his weapon shop, the Isher Sports Shop, and then the weapon shop beneath. And that is a reference to the weapon shop, which is a sci-fi short story. I think it's from 1954 from A.E. Vogue. I've read the story before, but I want to go back to it. So I'll probably do a bunch of different videos towards the end of the series to try to pull in some of these references that Wilson is making. But basically, you've got this traveling um, sideshow that's going on. And so Sal Roma, he's using this name still, Sal Roma or Rosalom, he contacts the owner of this and then he tells him, hey, there's this creature that you're going to want to check out and he tells him where to find it. He then also contacts um, a, a pharmaceutical executive, Luke Monet, or he's an executive and he's also an actual scientist. Um, so uh, I believe he's a biochemist. So you get Dr. Luke Monet who gets contacted by Sal Roma or Rosalom and says, hey, you really want to go and see this exhibit. You really want to go and um, test the blood of this creature. And what ends up happening is Monet ends up testing the blood. He sees this incredibly strange thing that's going on with it. And then he ultimately um, starts turning it into, like, long story short, he starts turning it into a narcotic that's being sold on the streets. Uh, but really the purpose behind it is that it heightens aggression. It heightens your, to some degree, it heightens your cognitive ability. Uh, but beyond that, it also heightens your aggression. And so it's being used, the, the one of the purposes for it is to be used for soldiers, right? That if you hype up a bunch of soldiers on this stuff, they're going to become even more formidable, especially if they're going against other soldiers who don't have this pharmaceutical advantage. So that's what he ends up doing. And that's basically the plot of the book um, that you've got Jack who gets pulled into this because you've got Nadia or Nodge uh, Razminsky. She is a scientist who's working for that pharmaceutical company. She's concerned for her boss because she's had this previous relationship with him. She's concerned about his strange behavior and the fact that her boss is now working with uh, Milos uh, Dragovich or Dragovich, who is um, essentially a, a gangster, right? He's from Serbia, he's this gangster, and he is in charge of selling this new drug called Loki or Berserk. So she sees her her boss, Luke Monet, get involved with this guy. She's concerned for him. And therefore, she then gets Jack. Um, she hires Jack to try to 
deal with this, to try to find out what's going on, because she's worried that Dragovich is um, in some way threatening or intimidating Monet, and she doesn't understand that they have a fairly friendly, maybe not friendly, but they have a fairly close business relationship. So that's how Jack gets pulled into this. He, of course, sees that the Rakoshi monster is still alive. He's concerned for Vicky because he thinks, well, you know, this monster was already out to get her. This is Scarlet, the, the Rakoshi monster. And he's like, well, he still has her scent. And so maybe if he ever gets loose from this sideshow, he's going to go after her again. And then he sees that the monster's dying. And then, of course, the owner of the sideshow realizes, oh, this is why it's dying. It needs human flesh. Starts feeding it the flesh of his enemies, essentially. And so then the Rakoshi monster becomes much more powerful. Powerful. And so Jack is kind of going up against all of these different things. And if that sounded like a, a fairly complex plot in, in terms of you're dealing with a fair number of characters, it's because you are. This book is actually a fair bit more complex in the number of point of views that we get as the story unfolds. So I mentioned it in the short spoiler-free review video, that this is a longer book than what we had with the first three Repairman Jack books. It's, you know, 60 to 80 pages longer than any of the other ones. Um, I fa in fact, I think compared to Conspiracies, it's almost 100 pages longer. So you're getting a fair bit more in All the Rage. It doesn't really feel longer. Um, and the reason why I think it ends up being the length that it is, is that you're just getting multiple perspectives throughout the book. So you've of course got Jack's perspective, but you're also following along Luke Monet. You're also following along Nadia or Nadia. You're also following along her boyfriend, Doug. You're also following along Milos uh, Dragovich. So you've got at least those ones. There might be a couple of other ones that I'm not thinking of, but it, it's it's a fair number of people who have all got different goals and different motivations. Um, and that's an interesting thing, that you're starting to see the, the plots become a little bit more complex and you're pulling in a wider group of characters who have all got different objectives. So that that's basically what you have in this. And I wanted to go over a couple interesting things. So one of the interesting things is what this drug, Loki or Berserk, does to people. Now, the otherness is using this, right? Razalam or Sal Roma obviously wants people using this drug. You see these violent outbursts that you get from ordinary um, people who would ordinarily never turn to violence. So it seems to be some kind of, it, it achieves some kind of disruption to society and it unsettles people and it troubles them. So there's definitely that. But it also unleashes this really dark, violent impulse in people. Now, Jack has got really dark, violent impulses, but they're always directed at people who really deserve it. And I think that's an interesting thing, because I think what you've got, it seems to be that Jack has almost a natural ability to tap into that dark, violent side of himself. Whereas, and when he does, he directs it in a reasonably healthy way, let's say. Um, he's at least finding people who deserve it. And he's unleashing it only when it's appropriate. Um, he keeps it in check most of the time. But when he does unleash it, um, it's pretty powerful. And you know that he has to be careful of this, that he does have those very dark, violent um, bouts of rage that he can go into. So when you're reading a book, All the Rage, then you're like, well, Jack certainly got some rage in him when it, it seems to come up. But it seems, so on the one hand, then you're like, well, what does that say then? Is that saying that Jack has got, that that rage inside him, is that part of the otherness? And I think, no, I think this is where you get some really interesting connections between the plot and some political philosophies. So, I mean, F. Paul Wilson has made it very clear that he's interested in libertarianism. I, I'm not sure if he would identify personally as a libertarian, but he's at least interested in libertarian political philosophy. And part of libertarian libertarianism is saying that the government should really not be involved in 
very much at all, that they should do far less governing than they're currently doing. And as part of that, you've got more of a libertarian approach to weapons, to the Second Amendment, the right to bear arms, that it extends pretty loosely, right? So Abe is absolutely a libertarian in that sense when it comes to weapons. Jack is, a, is absolutely a libertarian in so many different ways. And so then I think that it does have to do with weapons. That if you're looking at this and you're saying, well, if we're talking about something like gun control, then people who are strong supporters of the Second Amendment will say that a gun does not kill people, people kill people. And the idea behind that is that a gun is just a tool and it is a tool that can be employed either for um, evil or it can be employed for good. That a police officer with a gun who is stopping a criminal, that's obviously a good use of a gun. Or if you have, um, you, you know, let's say if we're taking one of the most obvious uh, examples of firearms being employed in to, to stop great evil, then you can look at World War II and you can say that the allies in World War II stopping Adolf Hitler and the Nazis and the Holocaust, then you're like, well, yeah, obviously having firearms seems like the best way to stop evil people from doing evil things with firearms um, amongst other weapons. And I think that's the point here, is that those dark, violent impulses that Jack has, I don't think they're part of the otherness. I think that they can be used, that he does use them for good. He's using them for purposes that will suit the ally. And then what you get here is that you have people who ordinarily would not have those dark, violent impulses, but because of this narcotic, it gets unleashed. And it's essentially saying that if you've got somebody who's under the influence, who is then wielding something that is incredibly powerful, you've got to be careful of that, right? And that that can be used for great evil. Basically, a firearm in the hands of somebody who's on drugs or a firearm in the hands of somebody who believes in a radical, evil, violent ideology that's an incredibly dangerous thing. It's not the firearm that's dangerous. It's the person who's wielding it. Um, and I think that's what's going on in this book is it's showing Jack can be trusted with that rage because he's careful about how he employs it, when he employs it, and he knows when to holster it, so to speak, that violence that he has within him. But other people who just unleash it um, without being careful in how they do this and how they employ it, that's really dangerous. Um, and that's how come Sal Roma is doing this. Basically, if you equip everyone with this very dangerous thing and they're also under the influence, you're going to get a whole lot of chaos that comes out of it. So in short, I think that it's okay if it is something that you are, are coming to in a genuine way and you're careful with it when we're talking about dark, violent impulses. But if it's a product of a pharmaceutical, that's incredibly dangerous. So that's a big part of the book. I'm going to try to get into a couple other things. So there's just a few interesting things that, that come up in this. For one thing, um, the movies that Jack watches they're always significant. They tie, I, I mean, I say always, I, I'm trying to remember with the other books that I haven't um, read in a while, but I'm going to basically go out on a limb and say that there's always a purpose behind them. They always tie in in some kind of thematic way to the plot. And so in this case, then Jack is doing a movie marathon for um, different adaptations of the island of Dr. Moreau, where you've basically got these creatures who get um, you know, the, these people who are mutated into various creatures because of this doctor on this island, Dr. Moreau. And you're definitely getting that with the otherness, that when the otherness touches people, it causes mutations, it causes um, various um, changes to their, at the genetic level, on the physical level. And so the, the quote that Jack continues to repeat in this is, you know, are we not men, which is from the island of Dr. Moreau. Um, and there's, you know, a little bit of irony in that because they, they're creatures, so they don't look like men. But the idea is that, is it your physical appearance that makes you a, a human being or not? Uh, or is there something more to it than that? 
And, and so I don't entirely know what to make of it. And that's why I'm saying that I want to actually read that short story anthology, um, the Ozymandias Prather Oddity Emporium. Is that the name of it? Yeah, he, it was Freak Show is the anthology that F. Paul Wilson edited. Um, so... I'm curious about some of these creatures because they talk about the Rakoshi monsters being their brother, right? And it's like, we know that the Rakoshi monster is part human and part otherness. And so, and we also get that in conspiracies where you've got, um, I'm, I'm blanking on the character names, but you've got various characters in this who have been touched by the otherness from Monroe in 1968 because of the rebirth of Rosalom. And so you end up seeing what the otherness does. Okay, so that's one thing. The other thing that, that's interesting about this is that the drug itself, Loki or Berserk, the, I think it's really fun that I think that F, I'm sure that F. Paul Wilson is doing this before we had a term for it. It's edited, editing reality. And so what happens is after the actual sample expires, after a, a full lunar cycle, I believe is, is how it goes. It goes according to the lunar cycles. That basically once the blood has been extracted, it will be active in a certain, uh, in a certain uh, chemical makeup. And what ends up happening is the actual chemical compound changes. It, it becomes inert. It, it doesn't have the active properties that it had before this. But then beyond that, uh, it edits reality itself. That any photograph that you have of the original chemical makeup of this uh, blood, it changes. Um, any memory that you have of it changes. And Dr. Nadia Rodzminski, she's going through this and she cannot possibly believe that this is happening. She cannot believe that this thing is editing reality itself. Uh, now, we do have a term for this now, which is a fun little conspiracy theory that exists online. It's called the Mandela Effect. And if you're not familiar with it, it is so worth looking into. It's really, really uh, fascinating. The Mandela Effect, just a short version of it, is essentially... There's this idea that we have parallel universes and um, multiple realities that are existing all at once and that occasionally something will change our reality and what it will do is it will retroactively go back and change things from history. And it usually works, but there's sometimes a little bit of leftover of the original memory that some people will have of the original sequencing of events and they realize so basically what we think are false memories are not actually false memories instead what they are it's evidence that something got changed in our reality for instance the reason why we call it the mandela effect is that when nelson mandela died there was a whole bunch of people who all went online and said i was sure that he was already dead I was sure that I watched the funeral for it. Uh, a, a really good one that I think of is uh, Berenstain Bears. So the books, the Berenstain Bears. Well, if you notice, I'm saying Berenstain, not Berenstein. And if you look at a Berenstain Bears book, then you're going to see that it says stain at the end, not steen. It's not S-T-E-I-N. It's S-T-A-I-N. And you're going to say, no, I know this. I've seen it with an E. I, I, it said Berenstain Bears, not Berenstain Bears. This is the Mandela effect. And you go, I know it. And then you go and try to find your version of the book. And then you're like, it's changed. No, I remember this. I know that it had an E there and not an A there. Now, if this sounds like lunacy, um, I don't know. I guess you're not one of the people who gets to enjoy this. Um, but if you're saying, you got to be kidding me, and you've chased after a Berenstain Bears book right now, you know, you pause the video, you, you go and find it, and then you come back and you're like, what? What is going on? Um, that's the Mandela effect. So there's a whole bunch of different instances of this happening. Uh, it's They're examples of false memories, right? False memories, I'm sure psychologists have documented this in various ways, that false memories are just a thing, but it's collective false memories where a whole bunch of people all have the same false memory. And so is that an example of reality itself being edited because of something is changing 
things um, or you know that you know we have now we were on this particular dimension and we've now jumped over into a parallel dimension where there's just these slight minor changes to things that we actually notice but maybe there's a whole bunch of other things that change that we didn't notice well that's what loki is doing and that's so great that he brings this up in the book and like i say he's doing this as best i can tell well before like probably a good dozen years before we even had a term for this of the mandela effect so i think that that's a fun little thing that that this is doing it's also very much science trying to confront the supernatural where you've got nadia trying to figure this out of what is loki itself and within that, then I think that's such a great description for Repairman Jack in general, the series. It's that it is science fiction confronting the supernatural, that you get this nice little blend where you have a whole bunch of stuff that seems like science fiction. And then you're like, is that science fiction? Or is that an example of the otherness? Is that an example of the ally that's interfering or, or intervening in our world, in our society, and a lot of things that we attribute to science fiction um, or even science itself, then is that because humans came across that naturally through the scientific method? Or is that because um, they were influenced by something beyond our own reality or our own sense of reality, right? That if you look at a lot of the, the technology that Tesla was experimenting with right the scientist nikola tesla um you know which obviously f paul wilson is interested in this and then it's like ooh, well that's actually connected to the otherness or he tapped into the otherness and uh the secret history of the world so it's just fun stuff i think that this book actually does a good job of showing that you get sci-fi you get the supernatural but it all gets explained by the secret history of the world that there's a whole lot more to our reality that we are just not aware of this is where you start getting into cosmic horror all right so that covers a, a fair bit of what i wanted to talk about um there's a few other things that i did want to mention for one thing, and this is just a, a little minor thing, but it's fun. Abe seems to be describing The Purge. If you're not familiar with these movies, he's describing these horror movies that have not existed in the year 2000. They didn't come along until, I don't know, maybe 2015, 2014, something like that. Uh, so this is on page 56 to 57 with all the violence that's going on in New York City at this point because of Loki, but Abe doesn't know that's the reason for it. So he comes up with a theory of why ordinary people are suddenly becoming violent. And this is what Abe says. Um, but seriously, did you ever think that maybe the city is too safe and that's why so many people are going mashuga? Maybe they were so used to feeling threatened that now that they aren't, all that pent up, unspent adrenaline is blowing their tops. Jack stared at him. This is what he loved most about Abe, his crazy theories, but he'd never tell him that. Abe stared back. No? That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Then how do you explain all those otherwise law-abiding middle-aged preppies going on a rampage last night? Uh, but basically, the idea being, it's such an interesting theory, the idea being that if you don't give people an outlet for their violent fantasies, they're going to explode at some point. And so the, these movies, the Purge movies that you end up getting is essentially all laws are suspended for one night a year, basically from sunset until sunrise and any violent fantasies or impulses you've had throughout the year. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be violent. It can just be any kind of crime, anything that's against the law, then go crazy, go wild, get it out of your system and you'll be much more calm for the next year. It's just really interesting that Abe has basically got this theory. He's got the premise for The Purge, and he's saying, that's what's going on. Um, his theories are fun, right? They're, they're great fun to read. So there's that. Uh, all right, the other thing, page 85. And again, this is just in my edition, so it might be a different page in yours. Page 85 brings up such an interesting question. Uh so you've got this guy, Sal. It's not Sal Roma. This is a totally different guy. So Sal, who's, I think it was his nephew, ends up getting killed by Dragovich. So the gangster that we've got in this book, Dragovich, ends up killing Sal's nephew. Now, Sal hires Jack to try to 
just go out and assassinate Dragovich in like to avenge the death of his nephew. And Jack is counseling him saying, you don't want me to do this. So basically this is what happens. Um, you know, uh, Jack says something along the lines of a life for a life balances the scales. Sure. But lots of times it can leave you unsatisfied. You're redressing an act that has caused a lot of heartbreak and pain to you and the people you know and love. But when you kill the other guy, it's all over for him. Done. He's gone where he's beyond pain and suffering, but you're still living with the fallout from what he did. At least I know he paid for what he did. But did he pay? Really pay? He's pain free and your sister's still hurting. Think about that. Um, so... Then And then basically Jack says, you know, well, what if we do something that's worse than death for this guy? And Sal eventually agrees to this, and you get those super fun scenes of the helicopter dropping the tires, the helicopter coming alongside and dropping all of the used motor oil on Dragovich and all of his guests at the party, right? And those scenes are so much fun. They're so terrific. But look at what Jack's saying. He's saying, if this guy kills a family member of yours... You don't want to kill him. You don't. Because then his suffering is over. And then you're still left suffering. And it's not going to make you feel better. It might make you feel better in the moment. But ultimately, it, it doesn't actually fix things. Uh, I'm genuine, genuinely am puzzled by this. And I want to know what you think. Do you think that Jack is regretting in some way the fact that he killed the guy... Who killed his mother because Jack has a family member who dies the guy who I forget the the character's name but he of course throws a cinder block over the overpass goes to the windshield of um, you know the, their car that Jack's riding in goes into like it hits his mother she dies so then he finds the guy kills him hangs him from the overpass and then trucks are, are hitting him and so that's basically how Jack becomes Repairman Jack. That he just leaves polite society and he just becomes an island of one, so to speak. Now, is he regretting it? Because he's telling this guy, you don't want to do this. That you don't want to just kill the guy who killed your family member. Um, and it's interesting because it doesn't seem like Jack regrets what he did. So then why is he telling this guy that it's not a good idea? Why is he telling him that it's better to make him suffer than to have him die? Um, I don't know. I just want some thoughts on that because it is puzzling for me because it doesn't seem that Jack actually regrets that. So then why would he counsel this guy and, and say that you don't want him to be killed? That you essentially want him to experience a fate worse than death? That you want him to suffer um, not just for a moment, not just for a few moments. You want him to suffer for quite a while. And that doesn't happen if you execute the person. So that's just, it, it's a question that I really do have. Uh, a few other things. On page 348, I did not catch this reference. And I probably, I'm sure it'll come up at some other point. But Jack says something to Nadia here. So he says, we were talking uh, we were talking adults before. Now we're talking about kids. I'm not into crusades, but certain certain things I will not abide in my sight. This has to do with selling drugs. And so he has a very libertarian position saying it's fine for people to buy drugs. Well, unless you're talking about children. And then he says, but certain things I will not abide in my sight. She cocked her head and stared at him. Abide? That's a strange word for you. Or a strange word from you. How so? It's something I'd expect to hear from a southerner, and you're very much a northeasterner. Good ear, Jack thought. A man who taught me some things used to use that word. She looked as if she wanted to pursue that, but changed her mind. Good. I don't know who he's talking about. Who's this person from the South who taught him some things? And I, I don't quite understand. Is that a short story? Because this is from 2000. So there's only a few Repairman Jack books. So you can't say that it comes up in the Young Adult series because that wasn't published for a while. And that also... Um, like, is it a short story that I'm going to find in Quick Fixes? Because I haven't read really... I don't think I've read any short fiction of Repairman Jack. Or is this something that comes up somewhere else? But I, I really don't know. 
So if you can tell me who that is, I'm sure I'll figure it out, or I hope I'll figure it out as I continue rereading the series, because I have read it before, but it's been a while since I've read these books. So I'm kind of puzzled by that. There's two other things that I want to talk about, and then um, one thing that I did not like about the book. Um, so you've got the pine lights this is on page 478 when jack is going out after the rakoshi monster then he has these strange the strange glowing orbs in the pine barrens that he sees floating through the woods and they kind of like separate and they come back together and um he says you know the locals call them pine lights and i've heard of different um versions of this i forget all the different terms for it i'm just kind of puzzled by that part as well um i like the fact that it's included but i'm not sure if there's anything more significant to it other than there's just a whole lot of strange stuff that's going on in the world and any strange supernatural things that we're not entirely sure if they're real a lot of them are real and we can attribute that to the otherness um and the otherness's influence on earth I think that seems to be what it is, um, that just any kind of supernatural stuff that you can think of, this is all part of the secret history of the world, that he's trying to give you the history behind it, that he's trying to give you explanations for things that seem to defy explanation. But if there's anything more to the, the pine lights, then please let me know. All right, at the very end, Jack ends up fighting against the Rakoshi monster in the woods, and he ends up losing. Um, the Rakoshi monster has got him, he's strangling him, and he could easily kill Jack, easily. But he doesn't, he lets him go, and so then the Rakoshi monster ends up going off into the woods, and then Jack comes out of the woods, and he feels, he feels entirely defeated. And, you know, even though he has essentially accomplished everything that he needed to accomplish in this book. The Dragovich is dead, Monet is dead, not that he was necessarily aiming to kill them, but um, the sale of Loki or Berserk from the Rakoshi monster, that drug is going to stop now that you have the guys who are actually doing this. They're now out of the picture, but Scarlet is still alive, um, and it's now out there in the Pine Barrens. As best I remember, he does come back in the series, but I cannot remember where, so it'll be fun for me to reread this and um, recall where he comes back. Uh, but Jack just loses. And I'm pretty sure that this is the first time that we've seen Jack actually be defeated, at least be defeated in any significant way, where it's not just a temporary thing where he has a small little setback, that ultimately he goes up against this thing and a Rakoshi monster is really nothing compared to Razalam or the otherness. It's just a tiny, tiny, tiny little part of it and he loses and he doesn't really know what to do with that. It's like, yikes, there's this thing out there that is so much more powerful than me um, that, and that's just one of them and it's incredibly dangerous and um, he couldn't defeat it. And, and that's, like I say, it's troubling for him. And then he leaves the Pine Barrens. He sees these hunters, um, these guys who, you know, have got expensive weapons. They obviously are, um, you, you know, they're fairly affluent men, fairly wealthy. They're off to go do some um, sport hunting, essentially. Um, so they're going off to go and hunt to, to cull the deer population. And then Jack says to them, you know, hey, you don't want to go in there. Um, there's something dangerous in there right now, maybe some other day. And then the hunter says, we can handle it, said the skinny one. Really? Jack said. When did you ever hunt something that posed the slightest threat to you? I'm just warning you, there's something in there that fights back, and I doubt any of your type can handle that. Uh, so Jack, on the one hand, is obviously giving them a very direct, literal warning. But I think it's also more significant than that. Jack is getting pulled deeper and deeper into this cosmic war between the ally and the otherness, and he is concerned. He's looking at this and saying, these things are a lot bigger than me. They're a lot more dangerous um, than anything I've ever really experienced. That when he's going up against other people, other human beings, um, typically he's going up against fairly seedy characters who don't know that Jack even exists and he's able to kind of work behind the scenes and he's able to outsmart them and he's looking at this and he's saying this thing is physically more powerful than me, it's got these abilities that I can't even understand and that, you know, if that's out there, who knows what else is out there. And it's 
concerning for him. So it's just interesting to see that that's how the book ends. It's not exactly a, a defeat, but it is Jack starting to realize that there's a whole lot more going on than he's ever really understood. And now he's getting pulled deeper into it and he is not necessarily always going to be successful. Okay, so those are all the, the really fun and interesting things that are going on in the book. One last thing, and, and I, I don't intentionally mean to end this on a, a negative note, but one thing that I saw in this book that you don't get in other ones, you've got, there's this, Wilson is using third person, I, I describe it as a third person effaced narrator point of view. What that means is it's an outside narrator, not somebody within the story who's who's describing it to us. It's in a faced narration, um, and it, it, it's a point of view. And so what that means is that each chapter is kind of following along a particular character, one particular character, and you are privy to, uh, and it's limited omniscient. Sorry, I should mention that too. Because for the most part, you're limited to their thoughts and their feelings, and he's describing their thoughts and feelings, and he's presenting them without using quotation marks without saying things like Jack thought and then quotation marks or italics because you'll see that Stephen King uses italics instead of quotation marks to indicate a thought. Well, Wilson doesn't do this. Instead, he just puts it in there as part of the narration. No, I actually really, really like that. In, in fact, I love that. Um, and that's one thing that in my own personal writing, it's one area in which I'm trying to get better and better. And that's part of the reason why I'm trying to get as deep into these books as I can because I know that that's something that Wilson does so well and I'm trying to see how does he do it um, and where is it working and where is it not working. So you'll notice that I pointed this out earlier. I think it was in the tomb where you've caught some chapters from Vicky's point of view that I think it doesn't quite work because he's giving her thoughts that seem too mature for a child to think. And then in this one, it's once Jack gets on, once he has Loki going through his system, when he ends up taking the drug, you start getting a ton of sentence fragments. So just an example of this, uh, this is on page 350. So he, these are his thoughts and he goes, what's the matter, he thought. It doesn't normally have things like he thought, but it does there. What's the matter, he thought. Afraid someone won't know you're a doctor? His irritation surprised him. Hung a left onto First Avenue when he reached the faded brick slabs of Stuvacent Village. Uh, notice that. It doesn't say he hung a left onto First Avenue. Um, you get other examples of this. Um, for example, um, what a load of BS he'd have to suffer through while waiting for Kasum to leave. Tempted to make a detour right now. Stop in there this very minute and tell them how to get their act together. Not... He was tempted to tell them, to go into the UN and tell them. They're incomplete sentences. They're sentence fragments. Um, he's taking out the articles, things like the and he. Um, he, in that case, is a pronoun. But he's taking out these articles in the sentence. Now, I'm not saying that you can't have um, sentence fragments in fiction. Of course you can. Of, and you can do it very well. And it can work in a really effective way. I'm not saying that you always have to include all of those articles and things like that and, and make your prose really, really um, formal because you don't. And I understand why he's doing it. I get it. What he's trying to do here is show, because we're in Jack's head, sort of, it's not Jack's point of view, but it's third person, limited omniscient, efface narration, as in efface, you're trying to erase the fact that it's a narrator and you're basically saying we're in his head, but it's not him telling the story. You're trying to show that his thoughts are going so fast because he's on this drug that he doesn't even have time in his head to use those extra words, those articles, the, he was, that it's just, that's, it's supposed to get us into his state of mind to show how quickly his mind is working as a result of taking this drug. But you also get that for the rest of the book in a lot of the Jack chapters. As you get into these action sequences, then you start seeing more and more sentence fragments. And so I understand why Wilson is doing it. I just don't think that it's necessary. I think that 
you have to trust that your reader is going to be reading faster when they're reading those action sequences because it's exciting. That you don't need to necessarily change the the style of narration to increase the excitement of the reader. I think that the action itself increases our excitement. And at least for me personally, when I start seeing those sentence fragments, it does the complete opposite. It doesn't put me into Jack's head. It pulls me out of the story. And I just get a little frustrated because I'm like having little sent like little words in there like the and he was that doesn't slow me down in the least as a reader. It helps orient me and it helps me to actually read faster. So I feel like I would be reading these chapters faster because I do read the action chapters um, much more quickly than I do other chapters. And so I think that it's just, it's trusting the reader um, to be f experiencing, to be feeling what they're supposed to be feeling in those chapters but this is a little too overt for my taste. That's just me. It very likely, and I'm sure for, for most people, you're not going to notice it. Um, or even if you do notice it, you might like that particular approach. It's just a personal thing that I have. I, I just wish he didn't do that. Um, and really, it's the first time that I've seen that because you have three books before this where it doesn't come up. And I'm trying to think of... I, I mean, maybe I'm going to start noticing it more in other Repairman Jack books, but it does not come up in the first three. I can tell you that. And then it does come up in All the Rage. The only thing that I can think is because Jack takes the drug, he takes Loki, and that explains, because that's when he first starts, the, 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 the prose, the actual narration starts um, removing those articles those extra words and sentences and you start getting sentence fragments it's only once jack takes the drug but then it continues after that that's the only thing that i can think of why wilson started employing that particular approach to his description but i'm not sure why he continued doing it after the drug was out of jack's system unless he it was just sort of you know, well, it's still kind of in there and it's it's slowly wearing off, but Jack's still got a little bit of that coursing through him, um, which it does mention, but I'm curious if I'm going to see that in the next book in Hosts, if I'll see the same thing happening there. You can comment on that. Um, it's, it's certainly not, it's not a big criticism. I'm not saying like, what a terrible thing to do. And I, I completely understand why he's doing it. I get the effect that he's going for. I just think, for me personally, that it would have worked better if he didn't do that. Um, so any thoughts on that would be really appreciated. So that is basically uh, my thoughts, my reactions, my analysis of All the Rage. It's a really fun one. I like all the different characters. I didn't spend enough time on it, but the scenes with the helicopter and I forget the name of the brothers, but the brothers, and I'm sure I... I as best I remember, this is not the only time that we see them. Um, oh, I can't remember what their names are. But the 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 brothers who've got the airstrip, the Ash brothers, there we go, the Ash brothers who uh, drop the tires and the oil, that is just one of those things of like, you can put it in fiction and it is just so fun because I'm sure that, you know, you, you could fantasize about this, you know, if you've got some incredibly obnoxious neighbor or something like that, just thinking of all these things that you could do. And it's like, I won't do that because, you know, I'm a civilized person and that's not the way to solve problems. But that in fiction, you can be, you, you can really enjoy that. And you can just say like, yes, that's so much fun. Um, you know, what a great um, attack against this person that ultimately doesn't take any lives, but boy, does it cause a mess. Boy, is it humiliating. And the fact that he gets, you know, Sal to videotape the whole thing and then puts it on television. And you can imagine what would happen now with YouTube and the internet and all of that of, you know, any kind of video like that, it would just immediately uh, go viral and everybody would be watching it. So I think any kind of attack like that would be even more effective. Um, you know, even like, five to ten years after he published All the Rage, because um, you're not just going to television networks anymore, right? You can post all these videos online. So those are just really, really fun scenes. All right. I hope you enjoyed that. Um, like I say, feel free to comment below. And uh, tomorrow I'm going to have my short spoiler-free spoiler free review video for Hosts, which is book number five. And then next week I will have the long discussion for it. All right. Thank you so much for watching. Bye.